Right, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Right, okay, thank you very much, Karen. Right, welcome to the seventh um, research seminar organized by HOPE. Um, you probably know HOPE. HOPE stands for the Hub of Pediatric Excellence. It's the research institute uh, in the Hong Kong Children's Hospital. So once again today, we have put together a very interesting program. We've invited two very good speakers. Now I shall introduce our first speaker, who is Professor uh, Patrick Wong. Patrick is now the Stanley Ho Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience, also the di Director of the Brain and Mind Institute at CUHK. Patrick is very, very experienced and a very um, excellent speaker. I've heard him sort of uh, uh, present and, and talk previously and a very entertaining and very educational as well. And what he's going to do today uh, is to uh, take us through the strategies for enhancing early language development. So uh, thank you very much, Patrick. Um, the time is yours. Okay, so I hope everyone can hear me okay. Okay, so let me share my screen. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm gonna jump right in. So uh, I'm going to be talking about strategy for enhancing early language uh, development. Um, so as a linguist and as a speech therapist, in my mind, the two important elements for early language development are the listening brain and quality parent-child interaction. So by the listening brain, I mean the central nervous system that's responsible for hearing. And in a, a moment, I'm gonna uh, share with you some data suggesting that the central nervous system, the auditory part of the central nervous system, including the brain and the brainstem, is actually uh, predictive, how it functions is actually predictive of how well a child develops language. Uh, and also for children with uh, language impairment, the integrity of the auditory part of the brain is actually connected to how well they develop language as well. Uh, and then I'll be talking about quality, uh, parent child uh, interaction, quality parent child interaction. By that, I mean that there are, I mean that there are actually strategies that parents can adopt uh, that can promote language development uh, for their child. Not every parents know how to use those strategies. Some parents just know naturally how to do it. Uh, but uh, parents can learn how to do it. And we actually have data suggesting that when parents adopt those strategies, uh, their child's language development is actually better. So before I talk about the brain, uh, let's talk about something uh, important uh, uh, conceptually about language development. So what we know from years and years of research and data from thousands and thousands of children is that language development is stable. So this is what stability means. So pretend that we have five children here, children, child A, B, C, D, and E. And uh, this is the language score and language ranking of those five children at age two years. So child A is not as good as child B, and child E is the best of the bunch. And uh, at age seven, what we know from uh, the research is that their ranking is relatively stable, even though compared to the to, to themselves. So child E, for example, uh, uh, child E improves. So stability doesn't mean that a child cannot improve. In fact, the child improves a lot when compared to himself or herself. But relative to his or her peers, children's language development are pretty stable in terms of the ranking. And in fact, uh, when we look at how parents communicate with their children in terms of the quality of language input that uh, parents provide to their children, we can also see stability. So we call that developmental stability. Now, uh, this is only when under a business as usual developmental condition. Why do we need to... Uh, so. Um, uh, one thing about developmental disability, uh, sorry, developmental stability is that uh, developmental stability does not mean lack of plasticity. And so, in fact, if the earlier we know where the child language and communication is, the earlier we can intervene. And we know that early intervention uh, is the best uh, in terms of uh, its effectiveness, uh, as well as uh, a return on investment. So uh, in order for us to overcome developmental disability, we need to think about early intervention. And so in the rest of, uh, uh, in the next part of my talk, I'm gonna be talking about how we can predict language development. 
early on, because if we know early, we'll try to find ways to intervene. Now, this is the thing about trying to make prediction. Uh, we want to do it early, so we want we ideally would want to do it on babies, right? Make, try to make uh, collect data from babies and make prediction about their language. But the thing though is that babies cannot talk, and uh, we also know that waiting. Uh, we can wait till the child is four or two to make a more definitive diagnosis. But in that case, we'll miss two or four years uh, uh, of uh, window of opportunity for intervention. And so uh, what we have done in my lab is that we created technologies uh, in which we rely on neuroimaging technologies to help, uh, to help us measure the brain or the central nervous system or, uh, of uh, babies in their early childhood. And then we use that data to predict their language development later on. We use two methods of uh, neuroimaging in my lab. Uh, we use MRI and EEG. I'll be showing you data from both modalities. And so we can use MRI to measure integrity of brain structures, for example, looking at the T1 and T2 scans, uh, as well as asking children to, uh, uh, to do some task in the scanner, like a listening task in the scanner, and measure their brain activities, the bowl signal. Uh, in some other studies, we use EEG uh, to measure brain waves generated as a result of listening to speech, what we call the speech evoked potentials. And later on, I'm going to argue that actually the speech evoked potentials can be a transdiagnostic marker for communication disorders. I'll come back to this point. So let's talk about MRI for a minute. So I think uh, all of you are familiar with MRI, so we can put the child into the scanner and try to scan the, uh, the, the child's brain. And uh, we've conducted this study, and actually this is a longitudinal study that we're still conducting. Uh, we study children with cochlear implants. So uh, we know that children who are deaf, uh, their language development is uh, severely affected, spoken language development. And uh, what cochlear implants can do is to help restore their hearing so that when they can hear, their spoken language can develop. Now, the thing uh, about cochlear implant is that it doesn't solve all problems. And so we know that although the auditory cognitive and language abilities of children with cochlear implant are better than their hearing impaired peers, uh, when compared to their normal hearing peers, uh, their abilities are still not as good. And so this is some uh, really uh, uh, in interesting data from um, from Naparco and colleague, this is a longitudinal study that they did about 20 years, uh, more than 10 years ago, but they started way before. Um, so uh, they looked at the language developmental trajectories of uh, children with cochlear implants. So these are the, the yellow lines represent each, each yellow line represent each, uh, a, a, a single child with cochlear implant. Uh, and they compared their language developmental trajectories with children who have normal hearing, the gray lines, okay? So you can see that for children with normal hearing, they have higher mean, of course, they have normal hearing, but interestingly, their standard deviation, the variability of their language development is smaller compared to children with cochlear implants. So when you look at children with, uh, with uh, cochlear implant, their mean is lower, but the variability is also larger. And so whether or not after cochlear implant, a child is gonna be like this child or this child, we really don't know. And so we need a method to try to make that prediction so that we can prescribe uh, uh, speech therapy and hearing therapy and music therapy accordingly. Okay. Oops. Oops. Okay. So in this study, we um, uh, look at, we use MRI scans that we took before surgery to measure the anatomical structures of children who are hearing impaired who are about to get a cochlear implant. And then we compare their brain structures with children who have normal hearing. And what we found was that in the auditory cortex, mostly the auditory regions of the brain, there are marked differences uh, between uh, uh, children with uh, who are hearing impaired who are about to get cochlear implant and children who have normal hearing. So it's in the auditory parts of the brain in the temporal lobe. And then we use these scans to create predictive models using support vector machines and different machine learning techniques uh, to predict their language learning outcomes. So these children, we follow them for a while. In fact, we're still following them. And we can classify them into children who would develop language better and children who would develop a poorer language. And uh, our predictive model uh, uh, is uh, cross-validated and uh, we can have specificity of up to 88% in a two-way classification. We can also make predictions parametrically and we can we found that uh, our, our, our 
uh, models can actually predict uh, uh, their language learning outcome pretty well. And so this is one example of using MRI and uh, understanding the auditory parts of the brain and use those data to make predictions about uh, spoken language outcome. Um, we can also use EEG as well. And so in uh, this kind of study, I'm going to be showing you data from several studies. In this kind of study, we would uh, play speech sounds to our subject. And in this case, it's an adult, but we can also use the uh, same method on our children. And so we can play sounds to uh, a listener. And then we can use an electrode, an active electrode here, to measure the brain waves generated from, uh, from their central nervous system. So we call this technique a neuro speech encoding technique. This is to measure the, how neurons, auditory neurons encode the incoming speech signal. And we're measuring how precisely the brain encode that signal. So I'm gonna play you some sounds as example. So I'm gonna play you a low pitch sound that we play to the subject. And I'm gonna play you back the brain wave that we measure from the same subject. I'll play you a low pitch sound and then a high pitch sound. And then what we recorded from the auditory system of this subject. Okay, so you should hear, you should be able to hear the high low pitch uh, being preserved. So this is what we play to the subject. What we recorded. What we play to the subject. What we recorded. Okay, so you can hear that the pitch information is preserved because the neurons, the very specific group of neurons that we are making uh, measurement from, uh, encode the pitch signal pretty well. And uh, to put it more technically, we're actually measuring from the inferior colliculus in the auditory brainstem. So we know that the auditory signal comes from the ear, and then gradually most of the fibers will go, recross to go to the opposite side of the auditory brainstem before it arrives at the cortex, or the thalamus, and then the cortex. And so we know that neurons from this part of the brain, the rostral brainstem in the inferior colliculus, is very sensitive to frequency modulations. So basically, uh, pitch information. And so this is what we're measuring. And we know that some signals are actually also generated from the auditory cortex as well. But the higher the pitch, the more likely that the signal comes from the inferior colliculus. We can use this technique to, uh, to do a variety of different studies. In this particular study, we measure the auditory encoding, the speech encoding of musicians. You can see that musicians can follow the pitch pattern more uh, precisely than a non-musician. We can, look, we can do, uh, use this uh, a signal to derive a, a number of different uh, signal, pro use te signal processing techniques uh, to make a, a variety of different measurements. And uh, we can see that musicians are better than non-musicians. Uh, we can also use te this technique to look at children with autism. And uh, so this is a study that we just published. And so this is a typically developing child, and this is a child with autism spectrum disorder. We can see that the uh, typically developing child's uh, pitch tracking or the neural encoding is more precise compared to a child with, aut uh, with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, so, um, and we're actually doing also doing a study uh, looking at children who are born preterm, uh, more specifically moderate to late preterm infants. Uh, we also uh, we are also seeing that uh, children who are born preterm compared to their full term peers, their speech encoding is not as good uh, compared to the full term peers. And that's why I'm saying that the, the neuro speech encoding is a trans diagnostic marker uh, for communication difficulties. So why is speech encoding so important? Now, uh, one thing that we know is that speech, so speaking as a linguist now, so speech determines word meaning and speech sound more specifically determine, uh, uh, determine word meaning. So let me give you two English examples. So in English, cat, k, a, t, three different speech sounds, when you combine them together, it means this animal here, a cat. But if you change one phony, one consonant here from k to m, is mat, it becomes another word. Chinese is the same way. So Chinese, uh, in Chinese, in addition to consonants and vowels, we also use pitch to mark word meaning. So the word in Cantonese, yu, 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 yu. So it's the tone two in Cantonese rising tone and the mid level tone in Cantonese yu. When you change the pitch or change the sing deal or lexical tone, it's another meaning, it's another word. And so that's why speech is so important for language development because in early language development, children first learn 
uh, learn how to distinguish speech sounds. And so we can use the exact same speech encoding method that I told you earlier to uh, measure uh, uh, to measure infants, to look at how infants, uh, infant central nervous system encode the incoming speech. Uh, so in this study, we asked a group of Cantonese learning infants, they're healthy. Uh, some, some of them are moderately preterm, but the, for the most part, they are uh, full-term babies. Well, we measure their neuro speech encoding. We present them with different Chinese speech sounds. And then after a while, we actually measure how well they develop language. And so let me give you two examples here. This is a child whom we call a poorer speech encoder. This is a child who is a better speech encoder. And we can use the very similar kind of machine learning methods, uh, support vector machines, support vector uh, regression, ranking. And so we can use these kind of methods to build predictive models to predict whether or not a child would eventually develop language well. And so let's look at the bottom graph here. This, so this is the random distribution per mutation. And this is a model that we built using pediatric factors like birth weight, gestational age, gender, socioeconomic status and family. So those factors. And if you only use those factors, the, actually the model can still significantly predict how well the child develops a vocabulary, for example. And so we have area under the curve about 0.7. Now, once you add the neural measures that I talked about, the neural encoding measures, our predictive model improves significantly. So we can have uh, predict, uh, we can have AUC of up to 92%, okay, when we add the neural predictive, uh, the neural data on top of the pediatric data. So then when we have a child coming into the lab, so uh, a new child, uh, what we can do is that we can measure the, the, child, the infant speech encoding, put that into our cross-validated uh, AI-enabled algorithm, and then we can make prediction about what their language might be like in, the, in, in toddlerhood. Okay. And so these are the clinical, uh, some clinical metrics data. We can predict their gestures. We can predict their comprehension. We can predict their production. We can move, uh, make a two-way classification, two-way prediction, predicting whether or not the child is going to be at the bottom quartile, or three-way prediction, predicting whether or not the child will be at the bottom quartile, in the middle, or at the top quartile. And our prediction can be the worst case scenario for AUC is about 85%, and the best case scenario is 92%. Again, these are cross-validated models. Okay. If you're interested in the study, you can uh, 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 scan this QR code and it will take you to the paper that, uh, that, uh, that talks about the, how we did the prediction. Obviously, this is a very highly interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary research. Uh, in addition to my, myself, we have colleagues from pediatrics who contributed to the effort as well. So obviously, neuroscience and engineering is important for this kind of research as well. Okay, so let me play you very quickly a video of how we do this. Okay, so let me do share. So in the test, the teacher will first turn on the face of the child's face. Then we will turn the electrodes on the face of the child's face. Then we will turn the electrodes on the face of the face. 咁呢啲貼片咧，其實淨係擺喺皮膚嘅外層啦，咁就冇任何嘅入侵性，亦都係冇任何輻射性嘅，所以對 B B 嘅大腦係絕對冇任何嘅傷害。咁然之後咧，就會將個耳筒擺喺小朋友嘅耳仔嗰度，播一啲聲音俾佢聽嘅。咁成個過程咧都大約半個鐘頭嘅啫。Okay, so that's how the test works. Let me go back to screen sharing. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Okay, so uh, this is how the test is done. And uh, well, I, many of you are pediatricians, so you understand that uh, we already have a, uh, an ABR test, a click ABR test, that's part of the universal newborn hearing screening. Why do we still need, uh, need this test, right? So in the standard ABR, we use a click sound to measure 
uh, whether or not the child might have uh, hearing impairment. So it's a screening test for hearing impairment. The click ABR is not measuring speech encoding and not measuring the position of speech encoding. And so while a click ABR is a marker for hearing impairment or deafness, speech neural encoding, it, what we would argue is that it's a transdiagnostic marker for communication problems. So for children who potentially have uh, a, a, autism spectrum disorder, uh, language impairment, and even preterm babies who uh, some of them might eventually develop hearing, uh, who might uh, eventually develop language impairment as well. Okay. So it's, it's, it's using a very similar kind of technology from the acquisition standpoint, from the analysis, uh, analysis standpoint is very different. The stimulus that we present to the child is also different. Okay, uh, I need to, uh, at this point, I think it's a good point to uh, declare financial uh, interest. So I have a tissue startup company based in Science Park that is marketing uh, uh, this speech encoding test. We call it precision listening. And we also have a patent pending as well. Uh, so that's why I need to uh, disclose uh, the financial interest. Okay, so um, at the beginning of the talk, I said that the two important elements for early language development is the listening brain, as well as quality parent-child interaction. And so I've shown you some data using MRI and EEG and different populations, children who have uh, cochlear implants, uh, children who are healthy, uh, children uh, who are born preterm. You know, I, I, I show you that uh, data from their nervous system, their brain and their brain stem can be quite informative in terms of making predictions about their future language development. So that's part of the listening brain. So let me now, I have a few minutes left, uh, talk about uh, child uh, parent-child interaction, quality parent-child interaction. Okay, because I think that's uh, the second most important uh, element in terms of early language development. Uh, by the way, by early, I mean zero to three. So this is about spoken language development, not spoken language, uh, not written language development. Although uh, spoken language development does predict written language development. Okay, so uh, how, so, you know, we talked about prediction. If we predict that your language outcome is not gonna be as good as your peers, how do we cost effectively intervene? You know, intervention, we know that works, but how do we cost effectively do it? Now, uh, we uh, know that er, you know, early education currently, uh, preschool early, uh, early education, we don't have a standardized curriculum, right? And uh, we know that from a parent standpoint, we want our children to develop language well, not only children who have language impairment, but you know, if, uh, for every child, we want to be able to enhance their language development. The question is, how do we cost effectively do it? And we know that, you know, uh, uh, for many parents, they rely on play groups as their early, uh, early educational activities for the child because there's no standardized curriculum correctly, uh, currently. The thing, though, with, uh, the, the thing with play group, though, is that uh, we don't have a lot of high quality evidence supporting uh, the, uh, uh, the effectiveness of, of play group in terms of enhancing developmental outcomes. And partly because uh, I think that one hour a week or even two hours a week, in terms of the dose for cognitive stimulation, that dose is just not, a, uh, not enough. And so what we're proposing to do now in our research is that we teach parents how to implement, implement play activities at home. So we, in our uh, research, what we're doing is that we teach parents strategies that they can use at home. And what we do is that we'll, we'll teach them the theory and the techniques online. And then we have them come to the lab to do some in-person play group in which we'll do coaching. And we directly coach how they should play with their children. And then we also have online play groups as, uh, to continue to practice as boosters. Okay, and so this is one example of it. So we'll have an instruct. So uh, we have an instructor doing this in our lab, in our playroom. Okay, so we have different families come in, and then we'll do it. And then online, we also do it so that they can, you know, parents cannot all come to the lab all these, uh, you know, all the time. And so that's why an online component is important. And so in this particular study, we're using parent implemented play activities, the music version of it. We're testing this version, uh, and. Uh, before and after uh, their, uh, these play activities, uh, we will measure their neural encoding. And so far from our pilot data, we are seeing that there's a, a moderate effect uh, in terms of how well, uh, how much uh, speech encoding is improved after this kind of music play activities. 
Uh, and music is very interesting because music is related to, uh, there seems to be a really strong relationship between music and speech development. So uh, this is a study that we published last year uh, with uh, actually Hong Chang, who's going to be the next speaker, and Richard, Richard Choi. And so uh, we found that there's a genetic marker for lexical tone processing in Cantonese speakers. And uh, another in interesting finding in that study is that music seems to modulate uh, genetic risk. And so for uh, so if you see allele carrier, your uh, uh, lexical tone perception seems to be poorer. However, if you also have music training, your, uh, you, you, you may not be as affected by that genetic risk. You know, this is, you know, just one study and obviously uh, needs replication and whatnot. And this is our post hoc analysis as well. But there seems, seems to be, uh, there um, seems to be, um, music seems to have this kind of modulating effect, even for uh, people with uh, biological risk for auditory difficulties. So. So in, in addition to music, we can also do some more specific language strategies. So for example, we teach parents how to talk to their children. So for example, the child may be saying car, 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 and then we teach parents that they can expand that sentence, say blue car, or the blue car is running really fast. So you give some, really, uh, some more complex language input to the child. And uh, from uh, a variety of research studies from different countries, we know that teaching this kind of strategies actually can help facilitate language development. But your trick is whether or not parents will adopt it and whether or not child, uh, the parents uh, will be willing to stick with these strategies and, uh, and regularize these strategies into their regular play routines. And that's why we're doing our research to hopefully design programs that would uh, help parents uh, to continue to use these techniques. Uh, so I'm running out of time. And so language is important for a variety of reasons, but I, I don't think I need to repeat. And I, I, I'm sure you know about, you know, how language is important for academic success as well. So uh, that's it for my talk. I'd like to acknowledge the different funding bodies, uh, Science Park, my department, uh, Faculty of Arts, and the Brain and Mind Institute as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, we are going to leave questions to the end uh, of the second presentation. If that's okay with you, Patrick, will you be able to stay behind? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to introduce our second speaker. Our second speaker is Dr. So Hong Jia, who is an assistant professor from the School of Biomedical Sciences. And he's also a by courtesy assistant professor uh, from the Department of Psychiatry. Now, Hong Jia is going to talk about the leveraging uh, genomic data in guiding drug delivery, especially concentrating on, on neuropsychiatry uh, psychiatric disorders. Right, the time is yours, uh, Professor So, Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, I hope you can all hear my voice, right? Um, so today I will talk about how to leverage genomics data in guiding uh, drug discovery. And the focus will be on um, neuropsychiatric disorders, which is an area that I um, uh, work on. So let me uh, go into full slide. So, um, so in this short um, uh, lecture or, or seminar, I will talk about briefly uh, some strategies for uh, drug repositioning, i.e. Uh, using existing drug for new purposes um, and leveraging what we call uh, genomics data. So um, I, I'm sure most of you um, uh, pediatricians or health professionals here uh, will be very aware that uh, development of new medication is a very lengthy and costly process. And the um, average cost estimate is around uh, $2.6 billion um, in, in a 2013 figure. So um, although the investment in research and development is increasing, there is a lack of proportional rise in the number of drugs approved um, in, in the past two decades, uh, with some exceptions, of course, but um, at least in, in the field of, for example, psychiatry that I um, uh, um, did research on, um, there is a relatively small number of new drugs being developed in the last two decades, um, especially those with novel mechanisms of actions. So we believe that there is an urgent need for innovative approaches, especially with the rise of all these AI, um, big data, um, machine learning, all these um, new technologies. Um, have developed in the past uh, decade or so. So can we make use of all these big data and um, advanced computational technologies to improve the productivity of drug development? So um, of course we believe that the answer is yes. Um, and in particular, we are interested in using genomics data um, uh, to, to help uh, or prioritize drugs for development. 
So we know that development of new therapies is uh, difficult because sometimes animal models or cell models cannot fully mimic human condition. And this is particularly true for neuropsychiatric disorders because we um, still have limited ways of studying the brain, although uh, um, this is improving. Um, so on the other hand, we have actually a lot of data coming up um, in the last decade or so uh, or, or, or in the past five years or so. So in particular, human genomics data, such as those data from um, what we call genome-wide association studies, uh, I'll talk about what, what they mean in a minute, So or sequencing studies. So basically, we are scanning the human genome right, for uh, variations at, at different positions. And now we have gathered a lot of this kind of data, and a lot of these data are also properly available. Um, for example, a database called LTHOP has harbored more than 2.7 billion um, genetic variant and SNP associations. They are gathered from GWAS. Um, actually, we have a lot of this, uh, uh, this kind of data. But um, on the other hand, relatively few systemic uh, studies and methodologies have been developed to identify novel drug candidates you are using this data. So this is our research objective, and uh, we'll introduce to you um, several ways of doing that. But before that, um, let me go to um, another short introduction. So um, the term drug repurposing or drug repositioning, uh, we mentioned it repeatedly in this uh, short uh, seminar. So what it means is that we want to find new indications for existing drugs, um, and which can serve as a useful strategy to shorten the development cycle. Um, and we know that we have a lot of different kinds of data. So omics data is one, and the other type of data may be electronic health data or other kind of uh, biomedical data, uh, which uh, many of which are perfectly available and some of which uh, can be applied uh, by some control assess mechanisms. So what is the advantage of using computational methods to prioritize, prioritize drug candidates? So one of the advantages is that it provides a relatively fast, uh, unbiased, cost-effective, and also systematic way to identify uh, or prioritize drug candidates. Um, of course, hypothesis-driven approach are also useful, but um, sometimes we may miss some candidates if we do not know the mechanism of the disease very well. For example, a new disease like COVID, for example, we don't know the pathophysiology very, uh, uh, exactly uh, or, or uh, extremely well. So if we do a uh, hypothesis-driven approach in a standard or conventional way, then we may miss some important candidates or important drug targets. If we leverage like uh, genomics data or biomedical uh, data or electronic health data, um, that may enable us to provide a more unbiased and cost-effective way to prioritize the candidates. Of course, we emphasize that these are just uh, some of the frameworks and methodologies for us to prioritize the candidates. We still need experiments or clinical data to support or to verify the candidates. On the other hand, given the extremely high cost of drug development, even if we have a very tiny improvement um, in, the, um, in the success rate or, or very re small reduction in the failure rate, that may result in very substantial savings in absolute terms uh, in terms of the cost and in terms of the, for example, the, the, um, uh, the number of lives that can be saved, etc. So um, we are going uh, to talk about actually the second approach um, on the right hand side. So the classical approach is that we have a lot of data, um, but we use, for example, our human mind to summarize them and then to think about them. And then we have some hypothesis driven uh, study targeting, for example, one gene or targeting one particular drug target or just a few drug targets and then do in-depth studies. So, of course, this is still important and um, still uh, relatively um, um, important way of uh, discovering drugs. On the other hand, we actually have a lot of new kinds of data. And these data comes in very large volume and uh, in great variety, then we can actually make use of them to generate new hypotheses. Um, in order to, to prioritize drug candidates. Of course, we may still need, and usually we still need clinical and experimental um, verification. So here it shows uh, the novel approach um, in which we can use uh, many different kinds of data like uh, DNA data, um, maybe mobile phone data, maybe social media. We have actually a lot of uh, um, uh, different data as well from, from, for example, text mining, and then we have drug data, right? And then um, imaging data, et cetera. So of course we uh, now, in this particular talk, we restrict ourselves to genomic data and to a lesser extent clinical data. 
So we'll talk about several approaches actually to um, what we call computational drug repositioning and leveraging genomics data mainly. And our focus will mainly on neuropsychiatric uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, so a larger focus will be put on um, neurodevelopmental or pediatric new, uh, uh, disorders like autism um, and um, intellectual disability, etc. But um, actually, because we have performed studies on many other psychiatric disorders, so we will also include them in, in this talk, like psychosis, depression, or anxiety disorders, which actually also um, can occur in ch uh, children or adolescents. Um, and we also emphasize the methodologies and analytic approaches uh, as they are generally applicable to most other complex diseases. So if you have other diseases in mind um, as a researcher, um, you have other diseases in mind for drug repositioning, so maybe some of the technique may also be useful to uh, prioritize some of the uh, targets or drugs. So I'll talk at uh, the first part, I will talk about um, uh, an approach using what we call de novo mutations to guide drug discovery or repositioning. If you're interested in the full research, um, you may take a look at uh, the paper which um, has already been published uh, recently. So as an introduction, um, we know these days we have different kinds of what we call sequencing techniques, i.e. we uh, scan the genome. Uh, different positions, okay, to look for variations, and whole exome and whole genome sequencing are two of the more advanced techniques that enable us to um, discover um, de novo mutations in Mendelian as well as complex diseases. So the word de novo means these mutations are not inherited. They are present in the offspring, but they are not present in either of the parents. So they, they arise new. So they're called de novo mutations. And usually these mutations have large effect sizes because they're not subject to such um, evolutionary pressure. Um, and recent studies have shown that this kind of mutation um, have play, uh, will, uh, plays very important role in several um, neurodevelopmental disorders like autism, um, uh, intellectual disability, and also schizophrenia and maybe epilepsy. Although we have um, increased knowledge about these novel mutations, our focus is a little bit different from previous studies. We want to see whether these targets, uh, whether these novel mutations can or may be able to guide us to prioritize new drugs for therapies, which have not been explored before. So our research question is relatively simple. So are the gene sets associated with neuropsychiatric drug classes overrepresented among the de novo mutations. So we know that we have different drugs already available for psychiatric disorders. So there are actually many different gene sets, uh, sets of genes, right? Like they are target genes uh, or what pathway these drugs target. So these will constitute what we call the gene sets associated with these drugs. So are these gene sets um, overlapping with the de novo mutations of these disorders? If yes, that means that these de novo mutations may be able to guide us to find drug targets or even the drugs uh, for repositioning. So for example, as an example, antipsychotics are drugs to use to treat schizophrenia, uh, um, which is a severe mental uh, condition. Um, so we hypothesize that, for example, antipsychotic drug sets, uh, gene, gene sets, sorry, gene sets may be overrepresented or overlap significantly with the de novo mutations of schizophrenia. And similarly, for example, we may expect that the gene sets of anti-epileptics to um, be overrepresented among the de novo mutations of epilepsy. So if this is indeed the case, then, then um, we may be able to use these de novo mutations to guide uh, discovery of drugs. And we also may we may also expect enrichment of actually drug causes, by SD and ID as well, because um, these are also uh, um, conditions that are associated with many psychiatric or neuropsychiatric disorders. So, um, so I've already said that if our purpose is true, then this approach may serve as a way for drug discovery or repositioning, because we can actually find the drugs whose gene sets are significantly overrepresented um, to serve as candidates for repositioning. So this is an overview of our research. So basically we use some established databases to avoid bias um, in defining the gene sets and de novo mutations. So these are also established and good resources. And then we test for overlap of these de novo mutations with the genes that are targeted or um, strongly associated with these drugs. See whether there's a significant overlap. Um, and uh, what are the drug classes we're interested in? We're interested in some of the known neuropsychiatric drug classes like these, and then we use some statistical 
methods to test for enrichment. And uh, we, uh, so these are actually some of the results. Uh, we quickly go over some of the results and we're happy to see that actually indeed there's some uh, significant enrichment. So to put the long story short, uh, basically you see these are p-values. So significant p-values are in bold. So you see a lot of significant results, meaning that there are a lot of significant um, um, overlap between the de novo mutations and the gene sets that are targeted by the drugs. So for example, antipsychotic gene sets are uh, overrepresented among the DNMs of schizophrenia and the gene sets of, um, for example, antidepressants, antiepileptics, and side drugs, uh, psychiatric drugs in general are also overrepresented among the DNMs of autism uh, this, uh, spectrum disorders. So that confirms our hypothesis that indeed there, there is some link between the drugs um, treating these disorders or the, um, the common comorbidities uh, of these disorders and also the, the de novo mutations underlying these disorders. And similarly, we find similar um, conclusion for anti-epileptics and also um, for intellectual disability. Um, but for the sake of time, um, uh, you may go to the paper if you're interested. And we also pick up some drugs that may be of interest, but of course, these are very far away from clinical application, but um, maybe perhaps in experimental studies. So for example, wild brain acid, we know that it's a boost stabilizer and anticon um, uh, some of the drugs in the retinoid today and so on. So we discussed some of these drugs in our paper as well, um, although it is still far away from um, actual application. So the other way is, um, so here we talk about a second method to um, find drugs for repositioning or repurposing. So before that, I would like to very quickly go through what is meant by genome-wide association study because we are going to use this kind of data to um, find repositioning drugs. So basically an association study com uh, is a study of uh, genetic variants. We want to see whether a certain genetic uh, variant or a genotype has different frequency in the disease group and the non-disease group. For example, a certain genotype may be much more frequent in type 1 diabetes patients compared to controls. So if this is the case, then this particular gene may be imbricated in the pathophysiology of type 1 diabetes, for example. So this is what we call an association test using genetic factors as a risk factor in, um, in a uh, study, association study. And we can actually repeat this process for millions of different genetic variants. And, uh, and genome-wide association studies or GWAS, uh, essentially uh, the, the cross of GWAS is to repeat the, uh, a similar um, exercise for millions of variants. Uh, basically, we compare the frequency of the alleles or the genotypes in those with disease and those with, without the disease. Um, and GWAS focus on what we call common genetic variants that are relatively common in the population, and we can um, target more than a million or even up to 10 million uh, genetic variants at the same time. Now, one of the problems is that uh, relatively few studies, uh, uh, several years ago at least, um, uh, focus on drug repositioning as one of the benefits of performing GWAS. So um, we know that there are many top genes that may be identified from GWAS and you can identify them as a drug target, uh, develop a drug against it, but sometimes they are not druggable. Sometimes they are in non-coding regions. Um, sometimes you may want multi-target drugs. So previous studies have just focused on also most significant hits and they may ignore the contribution of genetic variants that are less significant. So one of the approach um, that we come up with, um, actually built on others' work, um, is to make use of what we call imputed expression. So basically we know that the genes have to be expressed, right? Uh, but the expression of genes are somehow also controlled by your genetic variant, the SNPs. Um, there, there are some genetic control of the expression level. Some people may be born with a high expression um, of a certain gene, or, or some people may be born with a low expression expression of a certain gene. So these patterns uh, somehow can be imputed or estimated from GWAS data. So if we have, let's say we can estimate the GWAS imputed expression profile, and then we have the drug expression profile from other resources. Then if we look for opposite pattern of expression that we may be able to find drugs that kind of reverse the expression pattern of the disease and therefore may be useful candidates. So of course, this is not always true, but it's useful to 
um, see whether this hypothesis is correct or, or it can be used to prioritize drugs at least. So the advantage is that it's relatively simple to do and then we have um, um, expression studies are usually difficult to perform but G1 studies are huge studies usually more than 10,000 people and also we can actually using some computational methods we can actually impute the expression for different tissues including difficult to assess tissues like the brain so which is very difficult if you for example you cannot take out the brain of a, uh, of a living being of course and this is a post-mortem sample so so there are several advantages so again we just highlight some of the major results so one result is that we find for example some of the candidates are already drugs um, they are known to treat for example schizophrenia so we know that we are somehow rediscovering some of the drugs like um, some of the antipsychotics uh, are also on the list on the other hand we also use a more systematic method we try to see whether the drugs that are found by this method and this method is uh, of course blind to the known drugs uh, this method the, the workflow itself uh, we do not need known drugs to treat the disorder as an input so uh, this is kind of a blind uh, to the um, known medications to treat the disorder so our, uh, on the other hand we find that this method indeed can rediscover some known psychiatric drugs or drugs they are considering clinical trials so we are um, happy that uh, perhaps this may be able to help prioritize some of the um, drug candidates so of course uh, again this is far from actual application but um, um, but um, maybe some of the drugs that are highlighted, especially for some of the disorders like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, um, actually, we have a strong, we see a strong enrichment showing a greater promise with this method, uh, probably because of the higher heritability and also the larger sample sizes um, underlying their G1s. On the other hand, ADHD, ASD, um, these pediatric disorders, we, we may not be able to see very strong enrichment yet but maybe after um, we have much larger uh, GWAS uh, studies on these disorders so um, and then we quickly talk about um, several other approaches uh, one other approach is to um, use the gene sets from GWAS and then test for enrichment of drug associated gene sets from GWAS data um, basically, this is very similar to the first method in which we, um, we, we look for overlap between the de novo mutations and the genes uh, or gene sets that are targeted by the drugs. But now we are looking for GWAS signals and then we see what are the uh, or what drugs um, have gene sets that overlap with the GWAS top signals. So if, for example, a drug target gene um, ABC and this gene ABC are also the top signals from a GWAS of ASD, for example, then we may be able to conclude that um, because they target, because of the overlap between the genes, they're targeted by the drug and uh, the GWAS, uh, we may be able to conclude that this drug is a promising candidate for uh, treatment or repositioning. So basically, um, uh, this is very similar in principle to the first approach, but now we use GWAS data. So for example, look at the um, last sentence. If the genes that associated with disease X overlap more than expected with the genes that associated with the actions of a certain drug like drug A, so we shall consider drug A as a repositioning candidate. So um, again, to cut the long story short, we try to apply them to depression and anxiety disorder, which are uh, relatively common disorders, either in adult or in the child. Um, so we see that actually we, we do see a lot of significant um, enrichment. Again, we try to see whether the drugs they are discovered from this method um, rediscover uh, the drugs that are known to treat these disorders. So again, the concept of some, something like rediscovery of known drugs. So we find that we indeed can rediscover some of the antidepressant and antipsychiatric drugs of depression, despite the algorithm has no prior knowledge of what these drugs are. So um, we see that, for example, for MDD, a major depression disorder, um, then um, there is basically a lot of enrichment for the known drugs that are used to treat depression, okay, like um, antidepressants and antipsychotics can also be used to treat depression, actually. So um, so again, this shows maybe we can also use this approach or combine different approaches together um, to kind of help us to, to find drug candidates. So last but not least, uh, we'll talk about uh, machine learning approaches. So we know that AI or machine learning, these are some of the top um, areas of interest uh, these days. So can we make use of these techniques and also omics data, of course, to help us to find some candidates for repositioning? 
So this is our one of the approach. There are many machine learning approaches um, that have been developed or in the industry. Actually, there's a very hot topic in the industry as well. So one of the method we do is to use what we call supervised learning method. So our uh, thought is that we may make use of known drug disease relationships to inform positioning um, because the previous approaches um, mostly doesn't um, incorporate this um, uh, drug indications information. So here we, we present an approach that make use of known drug indications and drug expression profiles. So what we're doing here is what we call supervised learning approach, i.e. we already know the label of the outcome. And then we construct a prediction model and the outcome is whether the drug is a known treatment for the disease and the predictors are expression profiles of each drug. So in simple terms, we are looking for patterns of drug expression that will predict whether this drug can treat the disease. For example, the disease is depression. Uh, we see whether the drug can treat depression or ASD. Uh, based on the expression pattern. Um, and how to determine whether the pattern is um, conducive to treating disease, we use machine learning methods. The machine will learn what patterns are useful. And drugs that are not originally indicated, um, but have a high predicted probability of treatment regarded as candidates for repositioning. So here is a very simple diagram um, showing what we're doing. So there are some expression profiles for uh, different drugs. Um, and then, for example, for gene A, the first, so each row is a drug, each row is a drug. And then uh, whether the drug is indicated for disease X is indicated in the first row. So these patterns are very messy, but the machine can, can uh, um, have some methods. So some machine learning methods like SVM, uh, random forest, tre booster trees, and also deep learning, uh, which are relatively hot these days. So they can distinguish what kind of pattern uh, correspond to high potential of treating disease. Um, and indeed, we um, also apply them to several psychiatric disorders, notably depression and also schizophrenia. Um, and then we find again that the drugs that we find from this analysis are enriched for or uh, known psychiatric drug classes. So again, the concept of kind of rediscovering uh, the drugs that are already known to treat the disease. So perhaps some of the other drugs that are not known to treat disease may also be some of the prioritized um, candidates. And then we also use a relatively rough approach um, by searching PubMap for the number of research articles supporting the drugs. Um, so we, so we simply count the number of articles actually. So we find that the drugs they are ranked higher, but our method also receives more article support as determined by a PubMap search. And all of these methods apparently, apparently the deep learning approach performs slightly better than the other methods um, than in this validation exercise. But uh, mostly these methods don't um, kind of have very large differences in terms of performance differences. So. Um, in summary, we presented several computational approaches to drug repositioning. So um, at least four approaches are uh, briefly introduced in this uh, brief seminar. So the first one is uh, using the novel mutations, for example, of autism um, to see whether they uh, overlap more significantly with some of the gene sets associated with drugs. And the second method is to find expression pattern find drugs whose expression pattern is opposite to that of a certain disease. And the third method is similar to the first one is to use GWAS signals to see um, drugs, uh, to find drugs whose gene sets are associated with some GWAS signals. And the fourth one is some machine learning approach to find patterns of expression that will uh, predict the treatment potential. Um, but we emphasize that these are exploratory and further experimental and clinical studies are required to prioritize the candidates. And also we haven't explored how to maybe combine different approaches together. Um, they may output different drugs, of course, and how to combine different approaches and how best to validate them remains uh, uh, much of an open question. So I'd like to thank, of course, the organizers for inviting me to this talk, um, uh, uh, Professor Lee and also Professor Choi. And I'm very glad to have a group of my uh, students and postdocs and also collaborators um, uh, to work on these projects and also acknowledge uh, the funding uh, by uh, uh, local Asian, uh, medical fund, uh, NSF, CHMRF, and other funds. So thank you very much for attention and any questions are, are much welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Hongzheng. Thank you very much for another very interesting talk. Now we have time for questions. So uh, now it's open to the floor or to um, the audience. Uh, if you do have questions, you can either type in. I think you, that's the only uh, mechanism. You have to type in your question. 
any questions from the floor, let me have a look. Well, Joe, can I ask you a question? Obviously, you're looking at sort of drugs or, or um, mm -hmm. methods or treatment options for kids right. um, with autism spectrum disorder or ADHD. Right. Uh, do you think those diseases are actually curable? Yes, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so perhaps we, by using this kind of methods, we, we um, even this kind of uh, um, drugs may target some of the um, hypophysiology of the disorder, probably the, the, the disorders are not completely curable. So probably we are focusing on the symptom control and also um, maybe, for example, if there's some comorbidities, um, so if this disorder, so whether these approaches may also help because um, actually we have also developed some methods to target like comorbidities for, for example, some psychiatric disorders are frequently comorbid. So, um, so I think this is just a start. And then um, the good news is we have increasing amount of data, omics data, clinical data. Um, the Hong Kong government is pushing this and the world is actually pushing this and we have AI developing every day. So I think by putting all the things together, we, we will be able to um, at least to push it a little bit forward or to reduce the failure rate by a little bit then, then already may be helpful in maybe some symptom control or, or yeah, or something like that. Yeah, so so not an easy task, but I hope yeah, there will be something in the future, yeah. Right, well, obviously with autism spectrum disorder, uh, the earlier we are able to start treatment, uh, the better. I'm sure Patrick will be able to chip in as well. So um, I, I don't know, I mean, nowadays parents are paying so much money. I can tell you, I've seen families, they, they are doing acupuncture, doing right. alternative medicine. They're actually using a lot of money every single day or even per month in order to find a cure, the magic bullet for, for, um, for the boy, uh, for the child. I right. mean, um, I don't know, uh, uh, in the future, I mean, Patrick may be able to elaborate. Are we able to predict who is going to develop autism and then we can actually start some sort of treatment early on? Mm -hmm. and to uh, basically as a primary prevention rather than nowadays what we're doing is secondary even tertiary uh, prevention so hong Cheng and i has a grant under review on this topic <laughs> all right okay. are you able to elaborate a bit more i'll tell you if it's funded <laughs> uh, but we <laughs> uh we so uh along with some colleagues at hong kong you we're really uh, we're actually running a trial uh, in Hong Kong, a behavioral treatment program. I mean, so all we do is behavior, you know, all I know is behavioral treatment. I don't know about drugs. Uh, and so uh, we uh, are doing these pen implemented programs, like we teach parents what to do at home and so that the dose of language input can be a lot. So those are obviously targeting the social communication aspect of autism uh, uh, spectrum disorder rather than the repetitive behavior. Uh, but, you know, I think for, for many, many parents, their primary concern is that their child is not talking. And so we, we're, testing, we're, we're testing treatment methods uh, to try to uh, get the child to talk. When would you start? I mean, are you going to start early? Yeah. So preschoolers. These are all studies on pre. So the so the trial that we are running, uh, we're almost done and rolling actually. But uh, in terms of like making prediction and then make the if if we predict that you will have the disorder and then treatment, that's a grant that's currently under review. Right. So you know a lot of what Hong Chen said about like repositioning, like you know like so we're making predictions and then reposition what kind of treatment we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I mean just behavioral it's, treatment. It's, it's, yeah, even starting treatment at preschool stage is, is too late. Would you think so? Yes, yeah, so we want to do this as, as soon as possible. Mm. By, pre, by preschool, I mean like, I'm, you know, I mean like toddlers. All right. Including so, toddlers. Two to three years ago. Yeah, yeah sure. including toddlers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because in the States, you know, they're saying that um, you should be able to make the diagnosis by 18 months of age. Yeah, so you can do, so there are instruments, like for example, you can do an ADOS toddler module, but you know, the earlier it is, the, is the confidence, like do you have the, mm -hmm. the, 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 are you sure, how sure are you? Mm -hmm. But from the parent standpoint, you know, if I, if I was a parent, if, you know, if you're telling me that you're not sure, I think I'm still going to do treatment. 
Exactly. If I have the resources. It doesn't matter, right? Mm-hmm. If I have the resources, and then from the government standpoint, yeah. that's a completely yeah. different ballgame. Yeah. I mean, that's the main problem in Hong Kong. I've seen kids, um, obviously with typical features of autism, but not receiving anything until they're six years old. I mean, that's... Yeah, but now I think these days the diagnosis can come very early. Well, yeah. Like see. CAS, and then they actually see those kids early. I mean, the, I, I think the severe ones are easier to spot. You know, so, all the in- screening instruments that we have, have high, they have high specificity, not high sensitivity. Sure. sure. So. I mean, over the last five years, I'm definitely seeing more kids with um, autism spectrum disorder. I mean, this is really amazing. I don't know whether we are able to make the diagnosis better or this is a genuine increase in the prevalence. Um, yeah. but, but it's scary. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, So we have a question. Should I answer that question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, please. So believe it or not, I always get this question about bilingualism. (laughs) (laughs) So so should I talk to my child in Chinese and English? Should I just do English? Should I do just do Chinese? I have a talk on YouTube if you're interested. You can actually go up there and I I cite all the evidence about whether or not one language is good, two languages. Uh, And so what we know is that bilingualism is a good thing. Having bilingual input for the child is a good thing. Uh, And whether or not you decide to use one or both languages, uh, one of the factors is whether or not you're fluent in the second language. So I can tell you that we have a lot of studies from the US, from the UK, from immigrant families, suggesting that a lot of times the bilingual input is really a good thing for the child, for the dominant language, if the environment is English, obviously in the US. Uh, And uh, also, um, uh, it doesn't matter whether or not the child's native language is the the language English, uh, the child can still benefit from it. But the important factor is whether or not the parent is fluent in that language. So if you're interested, go. I mean, we have a channel, and so you can go up there, and then you can. Uh, I, I I cite all the studies. I mean, there there are a lot of studies. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. How do you do so many things? Uh, it sounds like you've got many hats on. What I just answer, I actually don't do, but I, you know, I have to teach this stuff and then I have to, I interact with parents <laughs> and parents are always, I, I, in fact, in a, in a couple of months, I have to give a talk to parents in the U.S. Because uh, this, like all over the world, like Chinese immigrant families, they always ask these questions. And so like I, you know, like my, my colleagues, uh, I have colleagues who do this kind of research actually, but, uh, but we, uh, you know, we are bilingual university. So people come to us. And then so, we, so I, I finally decided to do a thorough review of the literature so that I can give the talk. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any other questions coming in? Uh, feel free to email me if you are uh, if you have questions as well. Uh, and uh, you know I'm a clinician myself, and so I actually interact with parents a lot. And so I know many of you are clinicians, and you have questions that are not maybe not about the research per se, uh, but you know I, I hope I can help you translate. Yeah. All right, um, Karen. Do we have any? I mean, I can't see any other. Oh. Any other questions? Okay, we can. All right, okay. So once again, uh, let me thank our two speakers, uh, Professor Patrick Wong and also Professor So Hong. Yeah, thank you so much for your really amazing and educational talks. Um, Thank you again, and thank you everyone for joining in. We shall see you next month. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.